Xenophon, son of Gryllus, was born during the early years of the Peloponnesian War, around 425 BC, to a wealthy aristocratic family. Xenophon inherited the pleasures of the aristocratic Athenian male, hunting and horsemanship, as well as the duties, managing the family estate and cavalry service, all subjects to which he would devote treatises to later in life. As a young man, he also fell into the orbit of the controversial self-styled philosopher Socrates. While the exact nature of Socrates' teachings are difficult to recover, he was contemptuous of democracy, a stance that made him despised by the populist audiences of comic plays, even as he was revered as a master among a small cohort of wealthy and aristocratic youths. Xenophon came of age at a dangerous time the three-decade war between Athens and Sparta was reaching its final phase. He likely served as a cavalryman in the closing years of the war, although if he saw combat, he never mentions it. In 405, the Spartans defeated the Athenians at Agaspotomoi and starved the city into surrender the next year. The Spartans overthrew the Athenian democracy and replaced it with a junta of 30 men, the so-called 30 tyrants, drawn from staunch oligarchs who had long despised the city's democratic tradition. Cavalrymen, like the young trooper Xenophon, were leading backers of the new regime. One of the preeminent members of the Thirty was Critias, the former star pupil of Socrates. Once in power, however, Critias took a nasty turn, slaughtering his domestic enemies with frightening panache. When the deemsmen of Eleusis were suspected of conspiring against the new regime, a group of cavalrymen was sent to arrest them. They used a clever ruse to lure out their victims, summoning individual men by name as if they were enrolling them in the army, and then ushering them out the gate one by one, where a band, where a band of troopers pounced on them, threw them into chains, and hauled them back to Athens for execution. Xenophon's detailed description of this incident may suggest that he was an eyewitness, possibly one of the cavalrymen involved in this treacherous ploy. Soon, however, the thirty tyrants were deposed during a sharp civil war, as Critias's violent excesses uneased even his Spartan, Spartan patrons. The democracy was restored, and an amnesty was declared, which would have covered any actions a young cavalryman such as Xenophon might have undertaken in service on behalf of the oligarchy. But Xenophon had additional reason to feel uncomfortable in the restored democracy. Due to his association with Socrates and his anti-democratic intellectual circle, now strongly linked to the hated Critias. Despite the amnesty, Athenian Democrats were hungry for revenge. In 399 BC, they would try and execute Socrates on trumped-up in piety charges. Therefore, when Xenophon's Boeotian guest friend Proxenus, a mercenary in Persian service, sent a letter from Sardis asking him to join an expedition led by the cadet prince Cyrus, Xenophon leapt at the offer. Socrates counseled caution, reminding his pupil that Cyrus had been a key architect of the Athenian defeat in the Peloponnesian War and any connection with the Achaemenid prince might make the young Athenian's political position in his hometown even more precarious. Xenophon traveled to Delphi to consult the oracle about the venture. He was so eager to join the expedition that he cheated in his query. Rather than ask the Pythia whether or not he should join the expedition, Xenophon instead asked, which god he should offer sacrifice to before he set off. The oracle answered, Zeus Basileus. Socrates was dismayed at this, pointing out that he should have asked whether to go or stay first. The story, while it does not reflect credit on Xenophon, was almost certainly inserted into the Anabasis as a defense of Socrates, who was presented not as a teacher of impiety, is later charged and convicted, but rather as an instructor of proper religious observance. Xenophon departed Athens in 401 BC, 
never to see Socrates alive again. In Western Anatolia, Prince Cyrus had been methodically hiring up Greek mercenaries, men unemployed at the end of the, at the, end of the Peloponnesian War. His avowed goal was a campaign against the Pisidians, a highland tribe of Anatolia, where he served as vice-regent for his older brother, the great king Artaxerxes. But Cyrus had more ambitious plans. With an army based around a large cadre of Peloponnese and Peloponnesian mercenaries, he plotted a rapid inland march, what the Greeks called an anabasis, towards Babylon. His goal was nothing less than to surprise and overthrow his brother in civil war. Xenophon would later learn the details of the royal feud between the sons of Darius II. Osiris was the favorite of their dowager mother, how the rogue satrap Tissaphernes had attempted to have Cyrus judicially murdered on fabricated treason charges, how Artaxerxes on the pleas of their mother had pardoned his brother, and how Cyrus, shaken by this close call, had sworn never to be at his brother's mercy again. At the time, however, Xenophon claimed that he and his fellow Greek mercenaries were initially completely innocent of the task at hand. They were paid to obey orders and march where they were told, with no hint that they were plunging headfirst into an achaemenid civil war. Soon cracks started to reveal themselves. Cyrus was short of money, he executed two high-ranking Persians on the expedition. He enjoyed an intimate, possibly sexual, relationship with the Queen of Cilicia, whose husband was a staunch ally of Artaxerxes. In Taurus, the mercenaries refused to advance further. At this point, however, it was too late to turn back, even though some factions within the army considered doing so. They were beholden to Cyrus, not only for supplies, <clears throat> they were beholden to Cyrus, not only for supplies, but for knowledge of foreign terrain. They would be lost and starving without him. Cyrus agreed to boost the pay of the mercenaries, and enough, which was enough to get them marching forward again. It was not until they reached the Euphrates River that Cyrus told the soldiers the true nature of their expedition. The final clash between Cyrus and his brother fought on the plains of Kunaxa, just north of Babylon in modern-day Iraq, was a tactical draw. The Greek mercenaries swept away the Persian forces arrayed before them, but the Spartan commander, Clearchus, overpursued, abandoning the rest of Cyrus's army, so that Artaxerxes was victorious on other parts of the battlefield. The battle proved to be a decisive victory for Artaxerxes, however, when Cyrus recklessly plunged into the fray near the king's position, only to be cut down before he could strike his brother. With his death, Xenophon and his fellow mercenaries were stranded in the middle of Mesopotamia. Most of Cyrus's non-Hellenic force deserted en masse to Artaxerxes, but the Greeks refused to surrender for fear that they would be punished once they lay down their arms. Likely the officers would have been executed as confederates of Cyrus, and the men pressed into a lifetime of garrison service in the far-flung corners of the empire. Now that Cyrus's death had deprived them of their commander-in-chief, Clearchus, the Spartan, stepped up as the Greeks' de facto leader. By maintaining a well-guarded camp and a disciplined marching formation, Clearchus soon convinced the Persians that the Greek mercenaries would not easily capitulate. No matter how effective they were on the battlefield, the Greeks still lacked the ability to provision themselves, and worse, they did not know the way home. The two sides negotiated a three-month truce. Tissaphernes, the satrap of Phrygia, who was now the king's point man for this mercenary problem, agreed to provide guides in a market from which the soldiers could purchase provisions. In return, the mercenaries promised not to plunder the surrounding countryside and to expeditiously remove themselves from Persian territory. 
Tissaphernes soon proved treacherous. Of course, his entire career proved him to be the master of double-cross. The mercenaries increasingly sensed that his guides were misleading them, even as they had little option but to follow. Finally, Clearchus negotiated a fresh parley, believing that Tissaphernes would use his men for his own campaigns back in Asia Minor. After a private meeting with Tissaphernes, Clearchus arranged for a peace conference attended by all the commanders of the various Greek contingents. While these took the precaution of attending with a well-armed bodyguard, they were ambushed and overwhelmed by Tissaphernes' men. Clearchus and the other Greek generals were thrown into chains and packed off to be beheaded before the king. Only one general escaped decapitation, the Thracian Meno, who appears as the title character of one of Plato's Socratic dialogues. He nonetheless perished in a Persian dungeon. With the demise of the generals, the mercenaries selected new leaders in an assembly. Up to now, Xenophon seems to, have been, seems to have served essentially as an aide-de-camp for his friend Proxenus. He describes his own position as neither a general, nor a captain, nor a soldier. But his relationship with Proxenus was enough for him to present himself as a, log as a logical successor to Proxenus's subalterns. Despite romantic notions that the mercenaries formed a marching democracy, the new command structure that emerged was not necessarily democratic. Rather, like many Greek cities, it was an oligarchy. Most decisions were made by a board of five generals, of which Xenophon routinely presents himself as preeminent. A broader collection of company commanders, Lacagoe, pro uh, provided a broader war council. During the course of the mercenaries' long journey home, the generals from time to time summoned mass assemblies of common soldiers, but this does not mean that the army was democratic, at least in the Athenian sense. After all, popular assemblies were generally part of oligarchic regimes in Greek cities, used to ratify decisions already taken by the smaller oligarchic council, and to feel out popular sentiments before particularly momentous decisions. Xenophon presents himself as excelling in deliberations before the soldier assembly, with one notable exception. When he proposed that the surviving mercenaries found a new polis on the shores of the Black Sea, his plan was resoundingly defeated. With Tissaphernes' market gone, the mercenary army resembled a shark. It needed to move constantly in order to survive. Lingering for even a few days would exhaust local stockpiles, especially once they passed out of the fertile lands of Mesopotamia and into the sparsely populated Kurdish regions of eastern Anatolia. While the Greek heavy infantry had prevailed at Kunaxa, the hoplites soon found themselves vulnerable to Persian archers and slingers sent to harass their retreat. The army therefore retooled. 200 Rhodian hoplites reclassified as slingers, a Rhodian specialty, horses and armor were found to equip 50 cavalrymen, giving the mercenaries a small squadron for scouting and skirmishing. Indeed, it was the march across Carduccia, Kurdistan, and Armenia, where the Greek mercenaries faced their greatest hardship. Villages were small and far between. In some instances, villagers cooperated, turning over provisions in hope of speeding the invaders past. Other times, however, supplies had to be wrested away with brute force. Meanwhile, the fall turned to winter, just as the mercenaries arrived at the mountainous terrain of Armenia. Xenophon vividly recalls how he ordered a soldier to carry a disabled comrade, only to come back later to find him burying his burden, even as the doomed man twitched, still alive in his grave. The arduous march through the mountains neared an end as the mercenary vanguard glimpsed the sea, the Black Sea, prompting what is perhaps the most famous moment in all of Greek literature. Xenophon heard the men in the vanguard screaming and initially believed that they had been ambushed. Moving forward, he soon discerned their cries, Thalata, Thalata, the sea, the sea. 
The distant shimmer of the Black Sea did not end the mercenaries' trek. While they were free from the constant harassment of Anatolian highlanders, they still had no steady source of supply, although some Greek communities along the coast were willing to provide provisions in exchange for immunity from plunder. The relative safety of the Black Sea coast proved detrimental to the cohesion that had saved the mercenaries during their long retreat. The soldiers themselves decided to hold their generals accountable for actions during the march, resembling the Uthunai that Athenian magistrates were subject to at the conclusion of their term. Three generals were fined for neglecting their duties along the road of march. Xenophon himself stood accused of assault and battery, as he had beaten the man burying his still-living comrade in the winter storm, but was acquitted after a masterful speech in his own defense. In an attempt to increase the cohesion of the army, the soldiers undertook to elect a single commander-in-chief. Xenophon's name was floated as a possible candidate, but he declined the offer after bad omens appeared to him in a dream. It was wise to do so. The mercenaries were increasingly ungovernable. The man elected Generalissimo in his stead, the Spartan uh, Cherestophoros, lasted a mere ten days before the Akkadians and Achaeans in the army broke away from the main force setting off on a plundering expedition of their own, only to be savaged by Bithynian warriors. The army reunited shortly afterwards, the soldiers voting to impose the death penalty on anyone who might propose a division of the force in the future. The mercenaries eventually made their way to the Hellespont, where they caught the attention of Spartan officials who controlled the region. They attempted to sack the Spartan-held city of Byzantium and were forbidden from embarking on a fresh buccaneering expedition into Asia by the Spartan fleet. An employment opportunity opened when the Thracian dynast Seuthes II hired the entire group to aid him in his ongoing feud with his brother, Amadocus. Seuthes, however, failed to provide pay in a timely manner and the mercenaries soon left his service. By now, the Spartan general Thebron was initiating a new campaign against the Persians in Asia Minor, and the roughly 6,000 surviving mercenaries fell in with the Spartan expeditionary force. Next time, therefore, we will look at the war between the Persians and the Spartans in the 390s, followed by the so-called Corinthian War between the Athenians and Boeotians and the Spartans, uh, a war that is responsible for reviving the Athenians as a major player in Greece. We'll talk soon.